Welcome back. I'm Holly Geiger Lee, and I'm just going to sit down with you and read a poem that G.K. Chesterton wrote. It involves paradox, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. To recap, what is paradox? Paradox is an apparent contradiction that, when looked at a little more carefully, reveals truth. So, if we look at paradox in G.K. Chesterton's life, he used a lot of paradox in his writing, which earned him the nickname, the Prince of Paradox. So let's just take a little moment to read a poem from Winter Fire, Christmas with G.K. Chesterton. It's a collection of poems, short stories, essays, even recipes, and it's great for the Advent season and the 12 days of Christmas that end January the 5th. However, we're doing it now, and no matter what time of year it is, it's always good to revisit some of his best poetry, and I think The Wise Men might be one of his best poems, although they're all really good. So, uh, for example, after I um, go into the poem, we're going to do a little bit of analysis. Once I go into the poem, I'm going to point out the blaring or glaring, glaringly obvious paradox that's in there. And it has to do with the Christ child and his incarnation. So that's going to be in there. Spoiler alert. I've already read the poem to you if you watched the video earlier, and that should be linked. If not, then don't worry. You can find it on my YouTube channel. So without further ado, let's look and try to analyze our poem. All right, so here we have uh, the literary analysis that I have shared with you before. If you can see, when we start analyzing anything, it's good to read what we're analyzing first. If it's super, super dense, I don't know. There might be a case for not reading the whole thing until you kind of understand what you're going to do with it. But in my case, I'm going to read the whole poem first, which is what I did earlier. Then make sure you number your paragraphs um, or your stanzas. In this case, it's a poem. So stanzas are going to be the way the poem is organized. Look for vocabulary. And here we have, um, if I look at my cheat sheet, you should have this handout as well. I have found two vocabulary words that I did not really know. So I defined those. So that's the very, very first thing. If you want to go in a certain order, just underline your vocabulary words. And so I found these two right here. If you look, I numbered the stanzas and next to the first vocabulary word, I see I indicated it was in stanza two. So I'm going to go to stanza two and the word is labyrinthine. It's an adjective. Uh, so, oh, we have learnt to peer and pour on tortured puzzles from our youth. We know all labyrinthine lore. We are the three wise men of yore and we know all things but the truth. So much in that one stanza. Labyrinthine, when I looked it up, it means intricate and confusing. And you know, if you've ever been in a labyrinth, it's like you're going through this maze and it's intricate and it could be confusing. So labyrinthine lore must be the confusing stories of, um, you know, just all the old uh, folk tales or myths that maybe G.K. Chesterton had been exposed to as a child on tortured puzzles from our youth. So then if we continue going through, I mean, I don't recommend trying to chop this up too much. I just recommend going through it stanza by stanza. So I already looked at stanza one. I did have something that I noticed and on your page you should have a column that says notice, a column that says identify the literary device, if you can, and then the effect that it has on you, the reader. So in stanza one, step softly under snow or rain to find the place where men can pray. The way is all so very plain that we may lose the way. That seems, those last two lines, the way is also very plain that we may lose the way. That seems to contradict, those two lines contradict each other. Is that irony or is it paradox? Well, I'm no English expert, so I can't say definitively if that's irony only or if it's also paradox, but I know that there is something ironic about those two 
statements. They don't seem to go together. And it's not really clear at the point in the poem, like what that even means. But I think you know, what it means, the effect it had on me was to help me understand that things aren't always what they seem. You know, it, it you might think the way is plain, but if you lose your way, then clearly you didn't know the way. So we wise men might think we know the way, but our wisdom is limited when compared to God's ulti- ultimate wisdom. So that's what I got from that. And then stanza two, we already touched on the labyrinthine lore, but when they talk about, when he talks about, we are the three wise men of yore and we know all things but the truth, that is paradox, I would say. And it's like, you are wise and you know all things but the truth. So those are contradictory statements. And it's kind of clear that G.K. Chesterton is saying, you are don't know the truth. You think you know it all. You might be wise in your own mind, but you don't know the truth, the absolute truth. And so that's something he's making a statement, I suppose, about humanity, um, specifically humanity apart from Christ. Like there is this absolute truth and we're all searching for it. And some of us are able to finally come to the absolute truth and others may not know, but might think that we know and that we're wise in our own eyes. And I know there's some scripture to back that up, but I haven't gotten into that. Uh, Stanza three, I did write down, I have a lot of notes for this one, guys. Um, Round and round the hill and lost the wood among the trees, learnt long names for every ill, served the mad gods. Okay, so that's some kind of imagery right there. We're going around a hill. We lost the wood among the trees, you know you get lost in the forest. It's like this murky uh, place of confusion and you don't really see the essence of where you are. Uh, You might've learned all these long names for every ill, but still you're not wise. Um, And so we humans strive to find reason apart from God in the modern world. And I think that has some, has some significance for history as well. Like, we humans have always been searching and have found our uh, answers in other places, but in Christ. Stanza four, the gods of violence took the veil of vision and philosophy. The serpent that brought all men bail, he bites his own accursed tail and calls himself eternity. Well, if you go back and you look at that, the gods of violence, I don't know who he's referring to exactly. Um, but you could say maybe he's talking about if they took the veil of vision and philosophy, it's like they were trying to claim that they knew and they had foresight and wisdom, false wisdom apart from God and philosophy. Like I know in a lot of G.K. Chesterton's writings, he's spoken out against, you know, the modern philosophies and how that goes against religion when in fact philosophy and religion should be intertwined. And so he probably is trying to say like the veil is like, it's, it's a deceptive thing, but these philosophers are trying to say that this is truth. This is right when it's not. And so they're deceiving and that's imagery. Also the enemy, um, when we're talking about the serpent biting his own tail, that's Satan. And that's imagery from the Bible and calls himself eternity. And that's personification. Um, he bites his own accursed tail. He calls himself eternity. Uh, so if you think about how Satan deceived Eve in Genesis, he, you know, was trying to, uh, I guess, uh, completely, uh, it, it led to the demise, right, of uh, perfection. Like we had sin enter the world. That was the fall. And so... Um, The unwise are influenced by evil, the evil one, um, and are doomed to fail. But Satan ultimately is doomed to fail. He bites his own tail. I mean, he's not going anywhere. You know, that that image of a serpent biting his own tail. I mean, he's leading to his own doom, his own demise. So those who kind of follow in his footsteps steps are doomed to fail as well. Stanza five says, go humbly. It has hailed and snowed with voices low and lanterns lit. So very simple is the road that we may stray from it, right? 
go humbly. That's a theme. I've seen humble more than one place. And you'll see like towards the end, uh, stanza nine, it's mentioned again. And so that tells me that that's important, right? That's a theme. Humility is wisdom. And stanza five also, so very simple is the road that we may stray from it. Once again, that irony, those two contradictory statements, be careful to see what is plainly in front of you. Okay. And so have I found any new words? Yes. Stanza four, I did write down the word veil and it's a noun. And I found that it means evil considered as a destructive force. And so if the serpent brought all men veil, he certainly did. That was evil and destructive when he brought sin into the world through Adam and Eve. So, and then we have stanza six. The world grows terrible and white and blinding white the breaking day. We walk bewildered in the light and something is too large for sight and something much too plain to say. <clears throat> something about that white light, it's, it's, it's used in the same phrase as terrible. Terrible could be good. It could be bad. It could, <clears throat> terrible could mean something like very, um, kind of like putting the fear in you. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but the white light, I think that's some symbolism and it's blinding. It's confounding the proud. It's, you know, it's confusing when you can't see when you're blind, that white light blinds people who I guess are proud and think they're wise with its simplicity and its clarity. Stanza seven. Now we're getting into the meaning of wisdom and how, um, you know, we have meaning in this life and it's all throughout, but especially here we see it. Stanza seven, the child that was ere worlds begun. We need but walk a little way. We need but see a latch undone. The child that played with moon and sun is playing with a little hay. Okay, the child, who do you think that is? The child that played with moon and sun is playing with a little hay. Um, if you understand, you know, the Bible and how Christ came as a human, as a baby, but he was also a hundred percent God, that's the incarnation. And if you go back even to the very, very, very beginning before the creation of the world and the universe, Jesus was present in the scripture. It says he was present. The Trinity, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit were there together let us make man in our own image. So um, Jesus was the child and, you know, another paradox has hit us right in the face. And this is the big one. Jesus is the creator, yet also a baby boy. And that's put together in the same sentence. It's kind of a contradictory statement, but it's clear. Like that is something that is true, that it can be, he can be one and the other in the same. Those two are the same. And then if we look at stanza eight, the house from which, which the heavens are fed, the old strange house that is our own, where trick of words are never said, and mercy is as plain as bread, and honor is as hard as stone. Um, I don't know. I kind of glossed over that stanza, but I, I think the house um, from which the heavens are fed, the old strange house that is our own, it makes me think of heaven. Like, God is there. Everything that you need is there. And it's like our house because that's our final destination. Like that is what we are. We are created for heaven. And where trick of words are never said and mercy is as plain as bread, I think that points to perfection. Like there's no lying, there's no deceit, no um, unwise words. And mercy is as plain as bread. Like you get every day, you know, God's mercy. He is giving it to you constantly. And honor is as hard as stone. Honor will not fail. So I think that's heaven. Well, I don't know. Maybe somebody else knows. But I think that's what it is. Stanza nine. Go humbly. Humble are the skies and low and large and fierce the stars. So very near the manger lies that we may travel far talking about, um, you know, a paradox once again. So very near the manger lies that we may travel far. Like you don't have to go far to find Christ. He's here. He's available to you. 
Um, and then stanza 10, hark, laughter like a lion wakes to roar to the resounding plain. So that's a good thing, right? Laughter. And the whole heaven shouts and shakes for God himself is born again. And we are little children walking through the snow and rain. Once again, looking at God himself is born again. That I, I think in this context is the incarnation. Jesus is coming to earth. But also we have the hope of the resurrection. Christ rose from the dead. He was born again and he lives. He's not dead. So that is what we have. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. But he was born again too through the resurrection. He was not dead. He was alive. So we can be born again too if we trust him as our savior and our king. That's all I have for this passage. And so after you go ahead and notice and mark up and annotate, I did have a couple questions in here. And one of them was, um, oh, I can't remember right off the top of my head, but I wrote it down as I was annotating. There was a question I had. Oh, yes. The gods of violence. I wrote question mark by that because I didn't know who exactly he was referring to in history or in the Bible. Um, if you know, please tell me in the comments. And I would be um, happy to review if you have any thoughts about this. If I said something that you think, oh, I don't know about that, be sure to write them in the comments because I'd love to continue the discussion with you. So after you annotate and you notice and you write down what effect those things have on you and you've identified the literary devices uh, to the best of your ability, just like I tried, um, then it's time to reread and enjoy second time around. Um, really the third time around because we will have read it once before we analyzed it. And then now it's time to like take it back in and really understand it better this time for this final time. So I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I love GK Chesterton. I love the fact that he could take words and just make so much meaning come from them better than, better than I could for sure. Um, he's pretty amazing. So, okay. I do have a challenge for you now that you've had a chance to see the process of literary analysis as we looked at paradox in the poem, The Wise Men. Um, I want you to try to write your own paradox and it's a lot harder than you think. And I don't have a formula. I don't have a magic formula. However, I did think about this. And if you think about what paradox is, it's two seemingly contradictory ideas put together in the same sentence so that it's clear to the reader that there is truth to the statement. So here's my paradox. Okay. I, I did write this. This is a Holly original paradox. I'm kind of, I'm kind of proud of myself, uh, but you know, I'm not, this is the first time I've done it. I, I could never come up with the number of paradoxes that GK Chesterton came up with. So mine is about pride. Okay. Those who witness it are blinded by it, while those who possess it are blind to it. So that's about pride. I'll say it one more time. Pride, those who witness it are blinded by it, while those who possess it are blind to it. I challenge you to write your own. Just think of a two-sided coin with uniform imagery. It's like on the one hand, you have this characteristic. Um, and then on the other hand, you have this characteristic, but both are united in this singular truth. So like, if you think about the senses, that might give you a head start. It might jog your memory or help you think of brainstorm ideas, like what might you see or what might you not see, you know? Pride, you could see it if somebody else has it, right? But your own pride is very hard to see. You're blinded to it. And then you could think of like other senses, like feeling, hearing, um, you know, Chesterton had quite a few and I'm not going to get into all of them, but one of them that I remember specifically, other than this incarnation paradox that he has in this poem that we read is about hope. The more hopeless the situation is, the more hopeful I must be. So that's one. That's pretty easy to remember, but the more hopeless your situation, the more hopeful you must be. Um, let's see. Here's another one. The paradox of charity is that the weaker a thing is, 
the more it should be respected, that the more indefensible a thing is, the more it should appeal to me for a certain kind of defense. Strong legs run so that weak legs can walk. So anyway, thinking about charity or chivalry, I think was, was one of the things and the paradox of hope. Uh, something to think about. And if you need to Google more of Chesterton's paradoxes, they're everywhere, you'll find them. And I think that you'll enjoy just sitting and pondering them. Thank you for joining me once again. If you would like to check out more of my work, you can go to hollygeigerlee.com. I'm also at my little brick schoolhouse on Instagram and Facebook. I have a private Facebook group called Read with My Little Brick Schoolhouse. So be sure to check me out in those places and stay tuned for more.